Welcome to the Impactus Podcast. I am Dean Brenton, and we are here to equip you as men for a life of purpose and godly impact. The, the word persecution has become more common in segments of the Western church, especially through the difficult months of the pandemic. Health restrictions have often become equated with religious persecution, but today we want to take a global perspective of persecution. What is it? What is really happening in specific parts of the world to those who proclaim faith in Jesus? And as guys, what can we do to make a difference? I am thrilled today to be talking to Reverend Gary Stagg and Reverend Andrew Croft from Open Doors Canada, an organization that serves persecuted Christians in the world's most restrictive countries. Now, Gary is the executive director of Open Doors. He served in full-time ministry since 1983, Quebec, Saskatchewan, and Ontario. Uh, he's got a passion for discipleship, leading people to embrace a missional lifestyle. Gary's married to Ruth, and they live in Mississauga. And also from Mississauga today, we have Andrew, who's the communications and relationship manager at Open Doors Canada. And his passion is around strengthening the persecuted family and learning from their example. What a great line. He's married to Kate, and they have three beautiful girls. I have four beautiful girls. So, uh, You've got one more to keep up with me, but that's that's awesome. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the Impactus Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having us. It's a real pleasure for us to be here, for sure. Happy to be involved. Oh, it's so good to have you. Uh, quick fact here, Gary and I are from the same small hometown, home church in rural Newfoundland, Labrador. So that's a trivia fact there for anybody who wants to know that. But tell us a little bit more about Andrew and Gary and just uh, what you do and the ministry you're involved in. Yeah, well, um, I've been with Open Doors since uh, January of 2017, so just over five years now as the executive director. Um, we had, unfortunately, the director before me was, uh, he died in a motorcycle accident out in, uh, out in Alberta around Banff. And so it was pretty... Um, you know, pretty traumatic for uh, staff members here and so on. So I came in, that was in October, and I came in in January, and so I've been leading it ever since. Uh, I have um, followed Open Doors, though, for more than 20-some um, years. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, traveled with them way back when I was pastoring uh, to a restricted country, and uh, really that's when my burden for the persecuted church began. Back then, when I first picked up what we uh, refer to as our prayer calendar, which I thought I had one right here. And uh, I picked that one of these up at, at church, and I actually didn't even know that Christian persecution was a thing. Unfortunately, like you said, you know, I lived a pretty sheltered life <clears throat> coming from small town Newfoundland and really didn't know too much about um, the global family of God and found out that our brothers and sisters around the world are suffering for their faith every day. And so I began to pray for them. And uh, we have a prayer calendar that you just go through every day. There's a, there's a short prayer request. And uh, through that, my heart for the persecuted church grew. And um, ultimately, you know, being involved with Open Doors um, and, and so on, uh, through that, somehow I ended up here as the executive director. I'm not sure yet how that <laughs> all happened, but, uh, but I'm here. But uh, uh, open Doors. Uh, maybe, Andrew, you can tell us a little bit about the organization and the beginnings and so on, a founder. And sure. Open Doors uh, is a ministry that serves persecuted Christians. Uh, it started in 1955 when our founder brother, Andrew, which you can actually see right here, right, 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 right there. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he began smuggling Bibles behind the Iron Curtain into communist countries, uh, finding that the church was uh, feeling alone and uh, just his presence there made a huge difference, but they also had this great desire for God's word. And so that's where we began. Now, more than 65 years later, our world has changed a lot, but Christian persecution uh, has only grown. And so we now work in more than 70 countries, strengthening Christians where faith costs the most through Bible distribution, uh, Christian community development, training of leaders and uh, and converts, and uh, we do urgent aid and trauma counseling, so many things just to help the persecuted church remain where they are and be salt and light for Jesus Christ. That's awesome. I wondered if that picture was Brother Andrew and uh, a little familiar with his story, but that's, that's amazing. Um, so you publish an annual world watch list. Tell us about that list and what it's showing in 2022. 
The uh, World Watch List is a result of um, a pretty robust uh, research that happens all year round. So we have researchers that are in different countries. Uh, we uh, have people that are working behind a desk all the time as well, formulating all of the, um, the data. And uh, basically the list ranks the top 50 countries in the world where it's most dangerous to live as a Christian. And so um, it's, it's important for us to do that. And it's important that our ministry is driven by research because we want to know where are where we should be putting our emphasis and where you know where the where the funds need to go and and uh, to keep a really a keep a, a finger on the pulse of what's happening with with Christian persecution around the world and so we we publish this every year and for the past uh, four years since I've been here anyway we have taken the results of the World Watch List and gone to Ottawa and met with our parliamentarians. And so we invite our uh, supporters here at Open Door Canada to invite their MP to an event that we have in, um, in Ottawa on Parliament Hill. And we present the results of the World Watch List. And we have a speaker that comes and talks to them about what's happening in the world. And we have a different focus every year. And so that's been very positive, actually. Um, we're doing it again this year. And so it's, uh, uh, that's, that, that's, that, I think that's really important that we advocate for our brothers and sisters as well. And so this is a part of our advocating for them that we keep their plight in front of the decision makers in Western countries. And in our case, of course, Canada. So the list, uh, as Gary said, ranks the top 50 most dangerous countries. And from uh, 2002 until last year, the number one most dangerous country was North Korea. Uh, until this year, uh, Afghanistan and the events that happened in the past year have uh, have pushed Afghanistan ahead of North Korea. Not that North Korea has gotten any better. In fact, North Korea has just continued to get worse. It's gotten worse. But uh, Afghanistan has just got that much more worse. And so it, it's a it's a really important document, as Gary says. The research actually tells us that more than 360 million Christians around the world face at least high levels of persecution. Uh, and wow. so if you break that down, that's one in seven of our family members, our, our Christian brothers and sisters who are facing high levels of persecution. That's staggering. One in seven Christians around the world are facing some form of persecution. Wow. You've, uh, this episode will be airing in the month of June, and you've got another initiative that you launch around that, or will be launching around that time, uh, Christian Captives, uh, called One With Them. Tell us about that initiative and where it came from. Well, I can talk about where it came from because it was something that was really birthed in my heart probably, well, a couple of years ago, and uh, just thinking about um, the plight of um, people that are that are in prison, those that have, been, that have been abducted for their faith, those that are being held against their will. And remember one particular morning, Dean, waking up and um, that scripture in Acts chapter 12, where I'll have to paraphrase it, but it says uh, Peter was so it says so Peter was held in prison, but the church prayed fervently for him. And that really just kind of just hit me like a ton of bricks. And it was like, we need to pray for people that are in prison. And when we thought about it, you know, we thought it's not, uh, there's many different kinds of prisons, right? You know, there's, there's the physical prisons the, that, that people are sent to, but that there are also people that are being held against their, their will. And there are different, a lot of different captives in this world, Christian captives. And so instead of saying a day for prisoners, we made it a day for Christian captives. And uh, our goal is to really create a prayer movement in Canada for of people praying for Christian captives. And Andrew's the guy to talk to about how people can, you know, how that kind of from a from a vision of praying and and raising up a prayer movement for for captives to what it is today. <laughs> yeah, well, so one with them a day for Christian captives uh, centers around this year. It centers around Sunday, June twenty sixth, which is the day that we're calling churches across Canada to take a few minutes of their service and pray for our brothers and sisters who are held captive for their faith. 
Uh, it's praying for people like uh, Alice. Uh, Alice is uh, a Christian nurse for the UN who was abducted by Boko Haram in 2018. Uh, she remains in captivity today uh, because uh, because of her faith in Jesus. It's uh, it's praying for people like Dr. Kiflu. Uh, now this picture looks really old. That's because Dr. Kiflu has been in prison since 2004. And this is the best picture that we have of him. Uh, he is from Eritrea and he's in prison for his faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we really, as Gary said, want to raise a day of prayer. And so we're calling uh, churches to take time in their services on Sunday, June 26th. And then we're asking individuals to commit to pledge to pray for their brothers and sisters who are out captive for their faith throughout the month of June. And so if you visit uh, onewiththem.ca, uh, you can take the prayer pledge or you can download a toolkit if you're a church, uh, a pastor or a leader. Uh, and if you take that prayer pledge, you get a bracelet, just like Gary and I are wearing, uh, that says one with them as a, as a physical reminder to pray for our brothers and sisters who are held captive for their faith in Jesus. And so it's all about prayer. It's all about, hey, these brothers and sisters may physically be alone, but that doesn't mean they have to be alone, that we can visit them with uh, when we get down on our knees and we pray. Mm. Yeah. And the, the bracelet is actually looks like it's, it's plastic or silicone, but it's, uh, it's actually shaped like barbed wire. And so it's, it's a real discussion starter as well. When people see it, they wonder why you're wearing a piece of barbed wire around your um, wrist. And so, you know, you, it opens up conversation for you to be able to share with other people as well. Um, how, there are people that are being held captive for their faith and how it's important to pray for them. Well, that's a great initiative. We will make sure to put all that in the show notes so people can, uh, can check that out and participate. And we certainly would encourage that. So as I said, in the opening, um, the word persecution has popped a little bit in Canada over the, the last two years, especially around the pandemic. And, and I'm going to assume Canada ranks very low on the worldwide watch list that you compile. Um, we've seen, you know, the, the restrictions and, and things get equated with acts of tyranny and, and things like that. But what, what do you say to the Western church when it comes to having a, a real global perspective on persecution? Well, you know, I, I, I say that the, the closer that you get to the persecuted church, it gives you a better perspective on, mm -hmm. on what sure. we're going through here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will say that we do have a lot of secular intolerance in Canada, and, uh, but our secular intolerance really is nothing in comparison to um, brothers and sisters in North Korea who are living their faith in secret. And if they are found to be Christians or even found uh, to own a Bible, they, they would lose their life. And so, you know, um, I mean, of course, there are different levels of persecution. And the Bible says that all who, who will live godly will be persecuted. So, you know, some people take that as, you know, if their neighbor shuns them or if their neighbor looks at them the wrong way, then they're being persecuted for their faith. I think the big thing that you have to remember is also is, is motive. So, you know, to say that we're being persecuted because we have to wear a mask or because we have restrictions and so on. Um, what is the motive behind that? Is it the motive is the motive to attack our faith specifically? Because if it is, then it's attacking other faiths as well. So it's not Christian persecution in that sense. But I think the bottom line is that, you know, the, the closer you get to the persecuted church, because they teach us so much. And the closer you get to them and understand, in fact, what they're going through and what uh, what kind of persecution, you, you would say that really what we have with our um, uh, secular intolerance is, is really something that um, pales in comparison. Yeah. I mean, I always think when you're talking about getting closer to them, I think about um, I share, share stories, right? It's, it's stories of individuals like, Nasser Navard Galtep. Uh, Nasser is an Iranian believer uh, who is currently serving a 10-year sentence in Evan Prison, notorious Evan Prison, uh, for Sneaky crime man. crimes against the government. You know what his crime was? He attended a house church. 
right? Wow. Like 10 years in prison. I think of uh, believers like Leah Sherabu. Leah Sherabu, when she was 14 years old, uh, was abducted by Boko Haram with about 100 other girls uh, in, in February of 2018. A month later, uh, all the other girls were released. The only person who was kept in captivity was Leah Sherabu. Why? Because she refused to deny her faith in Jesus Christ. When, when given the opportunity to, to denounce her faith, she, she refused, right? She sent a message home with her Muslim friends who were, who were being returned to their families to her mother, and, and I'll paraphrase it, but she said, uh, Mom and Dad, you know, when we, when we did devotions around the breakfast table, you told me that God was close to those in pain, and I'm experiencing that now. But I know that I will see you again, whether that's here on earth or it's in heaven. Like as a 14-year-old girl, she recognized that her decision to follow Jesus could cost her her life, and yet she she held firm, right? And so I, I think about stories like Nasser and Leah and and anything that I hear in Canada pales in comparison to that. Yeah, it puts it in perspective for sure. Yeah. Andrew's mentioned Boko Haram a couple of times, and that's an extremist group that... Um, uh, is in Nigeria primarily. Yeah. I was going to ask you about any particular story. Is, is there a particular story for either one of you or both of you that really has put this in perspective that really has moved you um, to, to really uh, be pa- even more passionate about the persecuted church? Well, I mean, we, we hear stories all the time and um, some stories are so um, sensitive that we mm. can't even share them uh, with you and so, or with, with anybody really outside of our circle here. And, uh, but it's just mind boggling to see, and it, it's, it's sometimes very hard to, to listen to and see, you know, what's happening to these brothers and sisters around the world. We try to tell their stories as much as we can, but, you know, there are some that we can't talk about because, it would actually endanger their lives mm. more if it uh, was made public. And so, um, I mean, you know, these stories that Andrew uh, mentioned have certainly impacted all of us. And, and we, we hear stories every day. All of them really make a, a, a tremendous impact on us. Well, I mean, but you also talk about, talk about meeting some believers when you've traveled and, yeah. and how that impacts you, right, Gary? Like, Yeah, one of the things that I get to do in my role is to travel to these dangerous countries, and uh, we get an opportunity to meet with these these brothers and sisters that are experiencing this, again, under, you know, a lot of security, and usually at night, uh, after dark, and so on, meeting with them in their uh, house churches, and so on, and to hear their stories, again, I mean, I'm just completely humbled you know mm. I, the the thing is what's so interesting to me it, when that happens is they they think that we are like the giants of the faith you know we're coming from the western world our big churches and so on and and they're can you please pray can you please pray for us and i'm like actually can you pray for me <laughs> because i feel i feel minuscule in my faith compared to the faith that i see in you and what you're going through. Mm. And so it, it, yeah, it's, it's humbling, Dean. It's really humbling to meet with these people and to see the faith that they have in the midst of such adversity. That is, uh, yeah, that puts it in so such good perspective um, of what our brothers and sisters are enduring in so many parts of the world, but also um, the impact that that can have on us as well. Like, so as we kind of move forward in the conversation a bit, like why should this matter for Christians in Canada? Well, I think that it should matter for us because, uh, well, there's many reasons. One, Jesus tells us it should matter to us. Uh, (laughs) uh, Hebrews chapter 13 says, remember those in prison as if you were with them in prison, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that we can't uh, we can't neglect 
them. But also, I think the thing that we try to talk about a lot, Gary, is that these are our family members. Exactly. That, you know, Jesus is, uh, when he was teaching, he was, he was in this house this one time, and you can read about it in Mark, and, and his, uh, his blood relatives, his mother and brothers show up, and they're outside, and someone says, you know, hey, your mom and your brother are outside, Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, anyone who does the will of my father is my brother and my sister. Right, like he, he calls us all family members, and, and these are our, our people who are doing God's will across the world. These are our brothers and sisters. And and if my sister was abducted by Boko Haram, it would matter to me. If, if my if my blood sister, so it, it matters to me that Leah is sitting in captivity, that she has been declared a slave for life. Yeah, and and that's why we've we've adopted the language. Um, of brother and sister, family member, whereas in years past, we often use the words persecuted church, the suffering church, and and in a way, I don't like those terms. I mean, we use them because we still use them, yes, but I try to move away from it because in a way, when we can say, oh, you know, that's the suffering church and that's the persecuted church, in a way, it creates a distance between us and them. Yeah. So, you know, I I remember the words that uh, a friend of Brother Andrew years ago said, uh, and and, and basically, again, paraphrasing, but he said, there's not two churches. There's not the church in persecution and the church on holiday. We're all one church. And the Bible says that we're one body. There's just one body. And when one part suffers, every part suffers. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I would say also along the lines of why does this make, why does this matter to us? Because, Dean, I really feel that in, in the years to come, as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus, I believe that, the, um, that our brothers and sisters in persecution are going to become our number one mentors yeah. mm-hmm. here in, West, in the West. We have so much to learn from them uh, about what it really means to take up your cross daily yeah. and follow Jesus. We have no idea what that mm. means, uh, but they do. Yeah. And so they are going to become, they're already our mentors uh, for a lot of people. But I think more and more, they, it, it, you will hear a lot more from them. We'll be looking to them a lot more, I should say. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's that is powerful. I love that uh, the concept of not just it's just the persecuted church over there. It's actually our brothers and sisters uh, today, wherever they are, because we are one church, um, and the the scriptures really speak to that. So, what what difference does prayer really make uh, to those that are suffering? What does it really mean for those in other countries uh, to know that brothers and sisters are also praying for them in their situations? You know, um, I'll go back to when I travel. Um, We're going there again, you know, uh, with uh, trying to be attentive to their needs and and what do these people really need. And uh, so we just we just ask them because as an organization, we don't want to be, you know, like uh, these Westerners that are coming in, apprising the situation and saying, hey, we know what you need and this is what we're going to do for you we kind of reverse that and we say, what is it that you really want us to do for you? And the number one thing that they always say is something so simple, but so profound. And that is they, they always say, pray for us and don't forget about us. Mm. That's all, that's all they want. So, you know, we have to probe a little more to get more of what their real needs are, but, that's how important it is to them that the num- they know that the number one thing that they need above anything else physically, anything else, uh, you know, that we can any other way that we can support them. The number one thing that they rely on the most from us is our prayers. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll read a quote that I have here. It's from uh, Sombat. And he was he was in prison for three months uh, in Laos for his faith in Jesus. And he said this, even when I was in prison, I felt I was not alone. I felt your prayers. 
I cannot thank you enough for being also with our families and our children when we couldn't provide for them practically. Thank you for praying with us then and now. Like he felt the prayers of God's people while he was in prison. Uh, that's why prayer matters because it makes a difference. <laughs> and one of our main core values as an organization around the world is uh, we are a people of prayer mm-hmm. first and foremost. You know, we had this discussion the other day with staff here at, at, at our office. And I said, um, you know, yes, we want to raise money. And yes, in a way, we are fundraisers. Yes. But more importantly than that, we are prayer raisers. We are here as an organization, first and foremost, to raise prayer support for our persecuted family members around the world. That's my emphasis. That's where it all has to come from, yeah. that we are here to raise prayer support for them because we understand just how important prayer is. Mm. That's why our number one call with, uh, with uh, one with them is, is the prayer pledge. Take the prayer pledge and pray. Uh, it's the number one thing you'll see when you visit onewiththem.ca. It's, it's not... Uh, it's not the donate button. There is there, that opportunity is there too, but it's it's pray because we believe in the power of prayer and we want people to be praying uh, for our brothers and sisters who are held captive for the faith in Jesus Christ. That's awesome, and it certainly resonates with us. Uh, one thing we, we keep saying around the ministry of Impact as Promise Keepers Canada is like it's a ministry of prayer and. And so there's a real synergy between in this conversation. And I love that I the concept that, you know, the number one need that you keep hearing from people who find themselves in difficult situations like that is please pray and don't forget. And what a what an important role that we can play. So mm-hmm. one of the last questions I want to ask you is this. So we're a ministry to guys, obviously. Um oftentimes when it comes to prayer or even leadership in church, sometimes guys take a back seat to that so challenge the guys out there in terms of stepping into this moment to be prayer partners to be uh, concerned and aware of what's happening around the world well i would say you know um without without putting putting a guilt trip on anyone because i know that guys do not like guilt trips <laughs> true <laughs> and we can do the guilt trip part but you know i i think again it's not hard to pray for the persecuted church and and that's why our resources are available for people to pray for them so i mean it could be if you if you just picked up a prayer calendar, or you just go online, you get the prayer request every day on our website. You don't even have to sign up to get it. You can just find it there. There's a daily prayer request. If you just did that, I mean, it's like one little blurb and, but it's a real person and all you can, you can, you can pray that prayer in your truck, you know, or in your car as you're going to work or whatever. Well, you don't want to be reading it when you're driving, but (laughs) you you know what I mean? But just just something as simple as that. Like if you just start that, just start with that. Uh, You know, we're not, we're not asking people to start out and spend an hour of prayer for these brothers and sisters every day. We're saying, but if you could just take five seconds and start praying every day for them, you will, you will see the difference that will make in your life and how that will impact your life and help you also to keep things in perspective in your own life. And when you read about this every day, you'll see, you know, what other people are going through. And it's amazing. It'll encourage you to pray, but it'll also encourage you to say, you know, I'm, I don't have it that bad. Mm, and Andrew, you can do the guilt trip thing. Well, I mean, <laughs> you, you said you call men to pray. You're right. Uh, when I think of prayer warriors that I know from my church growing up, it was, it was older ladies. Yeah. Uh, but. And thank uh, God for them. Yes, Amen. absolutely. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I, but I think of, I think of uh, the book of Acts and the apostles and what did the apostles devote themselves to? Uh, one of two things. And one of them was prayer, mm-hmm. right? We're, we're called to be people of prayer. I, and I mean, it's hard to pray, but but it's something that we need to do because we need to be connected to the vine. 
and uh, and that we can only be connected to Jesus through prayer. And so uh, I just think that that's something that we have to do. And it is really simple, like Gary said, to pray for your persecuted family. Start with little prayers like that. I, For me, in my car, I have a cross. And uh, it says, pray for North Korea. It was actually made uh, specifically uh, by North Koreans. Uh, but it was simply to say, hey, pray for North Korea. And, and so every time I see it hanging from my mirror, it's like, I need to spend some time right now praying for my brothers and sisters in North Korea. And, and it's particularly bad there. Yeah. And, you know, we have an opportunity as well, uh, Dean, uh, where we have a program called Text to Pray. Yeah. And so if they just text the word pray to a number, and I have it right here, it's 647 694 four nine zero six we can give you that so you can put it on the yeah. screen uh, but um, if they just text that number they will get prayer alerts so you know twice it, a month it not, could be not it's not too many so a couple of times a month there will be like a current prayer request you need to pray now for brother so and so or sister so and so this is what's happening and so you can take a couple of minutes and just if it's like god help this person right now right where they are, you know, yeah. you're praying, you're praying for them and you're remembering them. And you're making a difference and you're making a difference. Mm -hmm. And awesome. so that's a, that's a good way as well. So, you know, just take baby steps at least. And, and, uh, you'll find that your prayer life will grow yeah. through it and you'll be encouraged by praying for the persecuted church. I love that. Great challenge for the guys who are listening and anybody who's listening today. Um, and I will say I've been really impressed by how easy you have made it with the resources and the tools that you've provided. Um, how can people get connected with you? Remind us of some of the, the uh, website links and things like that. We'll put it in the show notes, but what's the best way to connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. You can visit our website, opendoorscanada.org. Uh, and if you want specific information about the one with them, it's onewiththem.ca. Uh, but then social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Open Doors Canada, YouTube as well. Uh, and you can find all kinds of regular updates there uh, to stay connected. Yeah. Uh, you know, follow us on uh, Twitter. Like us on Facebook. And Gary's what are showing, the other things? Gary's showing all of his social media knowledge. Right <laughs> He's in good you company. Also, you can also find us on this thing called, what's it called? Oh, Dis we're on Discord. Discord. Uh, okay. We yeah. are on Discord as well. If you visit our Instagram profile and you click on the link, it, there'll be a link to get you onto our Discord channel. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what Discord is, it's like... Uh, kind of like a chat room almost uh but it's a it's a message board specifically a lot younger all, generation yeah, it, it is focused <laughs> on the younger generation and we also have our world watch weekly podcasts that oh, people yeah. can subscribe right. to cool and uh, that gives up-to-date information weekly and so those th those are really good ways there are also opportunities for people men to travel to uh the persecuted church it's uh you know it, if you it's, it's not the tip. I just will say that it's not the typical men's um, missions trip. We don't normally go to build buildings and construct things and all of that stuff because that would just bring way too much attention to the people that we're trying to protect. But, you know, we go to encourage them. We call it our international presence ministry. Yeah. We don't call it a travel ministry, but it's a presence. And basically to let them know that that we care enough to come yeah. to them and to be with them. And so we have a trip planned for Sri Lanka in the fall. Yeah. And then next year, I think Morocco and Egypt. And so, you know, that's open for Canadians to go and uh, just to be an encouragement to these brothers and sisters. Yeah. In their faith. When Brother Andrew first uh, crossed the Iron Curtain, went into Poland, he met a Christian there and, and the church leader. And he said, you being here is worth 10 of your best sermons. Wow. And that's where the whole idea of presence ministry comes from, that the very fact that we would make the effort to be with them uh, makes a huge difference. Yeah, it's, presence ministry is a huge thing with us. And Brother Andrew also always said, and we still abide by it, that if we can't, if we can't um, hand deliver a Bible to somebody, then we don't do it. 
We don't mm. drop them from the sky. We don't have, we, it's still always very personal that this Bible is placed in the person's hand, you know? And so we still, we still operate like that yeah. because we know how important it is to them. That's so good. And I love so many opportunities for people to get involved, just to do, do one thing. So for everybody who's listening, I, I challenge you to do one thing, go to opendoorscanada.org and, and whether it's follow on Twitter, get the, the watch list, start to pray and participate and see what God will ask you to do or, or what, uh, how he will use you to encourage those who uh, find themselves in so difficult circumstances. Gary, I'm going to ask you to have a prayer for us today for those, our brothers and sisters who are suffering for their faith. Um, Andrew, you quoted this scripture earlier, and I want to read it again. It's Hebrews 13, 3, to continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. I mean, that is powerful. So as Gary leads us, let's continue to be uh, brothers and sisters worldwide who, who are praying for our brothers and sisters worldwide for the sake of the gospel. Gary, would you lead us? Yes. Father, we just come before you today in the precious name of Jesus. We're so thankful, Lord, for your mercy and your grace that we experience on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Today, Lord, our hearts turn towards these brothers and sisters all around the world uh, who are experiencing these high levels of persecution and discrimination because of their faith in you. All that they are doing, Lord, is just uh, following you and naming the name of Christ. And Lord, we pray today that you would be with them in such a powerful way. We pray, Lord, we know that as we pray, it can transcend time and boundaries. And so, Father, we pray today that even now as we're praying together, as we join as a group of men here, Lord, we pray that you would help us, help these people to know, Lord, that we are standing with them. Mm -hmm. More importantly today, Lord, I pray that they would sense your peace and that they would sense your presence, oh God, wherever they are, to know that they that you are with them, that you'll never leave them, you'll never forsake them. Help them to know, Lord, that there are those of us as well around other parts of the world that are standing with them and that they are not alone. I thank you for um, all of the men that are watching this episode today. I pray a blessing upon them. Lord, you know their needs. You know um, their family needs. And so we pray today that you would suit a miracle to each and every need. And we ask you all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Gary, for joining us today. Uh, we pray a huge blessing on your ministry and the work that you do, being a voice for the voiceless and raising up prayer and, uh, and awareness for those brothers and sisters um, that are, uh, need that today. So thanks, thanks for your work and blessings on everything you do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Impactus podcast. To learn more about living a life of purpose and godly impact, check out impactus.org.